How's it going, everybody? This is Ron Sparkman from Stardom, and today we have a very special interview with one and only Chris Carberry, the CEO and the co-founder of Explore Mars, which has its big event coming up on May 14th to the 16th, 2019, Washington, D.C., the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, D.C. Man, I'm super excited about this. Chris, it's good to talk to you again. How have you been? Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having me on. We're glad to have you. And, uh, you know, so we've already done the prior interview, so people got a little bit of your background. So we're going to go right into the big event. Everything's coming up next month. We're very excited about it. But for those that are new to the space and the various events dedicated to it, can you tell us what Explore to Mars and the Humans to Mars Summit is all about and how it's different from other events? Well, first off, the Humans to Mars Summit is the largest conference, annual conference in the world focused on sending humans to Mars. We do it every year in Washington, D.C., this will be the seventh year that we're doing seventh year, 2013 till now, yeah, uh, that we've done this event. And, um, you know, it's always, we always are able to bring in the top speakers in industry at NASA, yeah, international speakers, as well as we try to uh, highlight, you know, top level STEM education professionals, people dealing with technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. We always try to bring in people from Silicon Valley or the entertainment industry. So it's not just, you know, the industry and the NASA. NASA folks, but that we should probably try to uh, uh, reach a much broader uh, group, you know, so we can reach out beyond the usual circles. Yeah, I know that's always a big deal is that uh, this is an event that allows uh, pretty much everybody to come, which is one of the reasons that I love it so much. So uh, before we kind of get into, into the deeper details of what people are going to expect as they come, let's talk a little bit about some of the panelists and uh, some of the events that you have coming up this year. Uh, NASA's newest administrator, Jim Bridenstine, he made his first public address at the 2018 Humans to Mars Summit. He's coming back again this year, next month for H2M uh, 2019. So what do you expect this message to be and uh, what do you hope he'll say? Well, you know, it's a very interesting time. We've had an awful lot of policy development since last time we had him and, you know, just in the last three months. So I think everybody's going to be interested to hear what he has to say about this new accelerated time frame for human space flight. Do you know, you know, during the Space Council meeting, um, uh, Vice President Pence and um, Administrator Bridenstine talked about plans of getting humans back on the surface of the moon by 2024 and then Mar to Mars in 2033. And so, of course, that, and we're very excited about that. So we're hoping that the administrator will be able to go into detail on that and, and talk about, you know, maybe the budget, the reform revised budget will have come out by then. And we hope we'll be able to see some details. So we just, you know, because we're all worried. It's all, we're excited about the plan, but we don't want it to be one another one of these grand plans that aren't, aren't funded or do not have the, uh, the required political long-term sustainable political support also. So yep. it's a very good time. And, you know, it's, you know, more, a couple of months after the initial announcement. So a little bit of time for them to, you know, work through some of the details. So I think timing's very good. But then we'll be following that panel directly by a panel that's looking directly at that um, plan specifically. You know, can landing humans on the moon in 2024 help advance the goal of getting humans to Mars in 2033? Mm -hmm. And John Logsdon from uh, GW. You, uh, and elsewhere, you know, on that panel, talking about, you know, the pros and cons, what the biggest challenges will be. So that, that, that'll be a great follow-up panel as well. That, sound, uh, that sounds great. I, you know, that's, I think that's really kind of the big one we keep hearing about, you know, 2024. And uh, because it is such a major step, and you know, we, don't want to, we don't want to go too far too fast. And it does seem very demanding. Um, you know, and another big topic that you guys will be discussing this year, uh, STEM, it's huge. Mine's like Ellen Stove fan, you know, Ivy, David Newman, uh, all of them will be discussing the importance of STEM. Uh, so why is it so important for Explore Mars to highlight that? Well, it's always been, it's been a core of what we do from the beginning. You know, when we started off our very first project, when we were founded back in 20, we were founded in 2010, and pretty much almost the second we actually had a name for the group, we had started STEM education. We started partnering with the National Science Teachers Association back then, and uh, ran a uh, teacher's, um, basically a Mars science teacher's competition. Mm -hmm. And from there, we continued doing it. So you're right, this year we have, you know, some great STEM programming. You know, in addition to that, I'll get back to them, we also have representatives from the Afghan Girls Robotics Team. It's a really impressive group of young women from Afghanistan who are literally risking their lives to pursue STEM education and Mars exploration. 
And so uh, we're lucky to have their flying in from Afghanistan. Actually, the Musk Foundation is paying for their travel. So we're happy, you know, that Elon's uh, foundation will be covering that. And But as you mentioned, we also have um, Janet Ivey, who will be running this great STEM panel, you know, with, as you mentioned, Alan Stofan, with um, uh, Dava Newman, with uh, Rachel Mann, and, and a student from the Weiss School down in Florida. I apologize. I can't remember the name of the student because I don't have the agenda right in front of me. <laughs> no one. No worries. No worries. It'll be a really interesting one to get the STEM perspective from different angles. And so... Uh, but Janet will also be running a side workshop we've been doing every year where she brings in scouts and other students to go through all these hands-on exercises. So a lot of interesting things going on, but there'll also be a, a session that's also connecting the entertainment industry space at STEM, kind of looking how television and connects with, and movies connect with space, but how those can be utilized to advance STEM education as well. So. It's always woven throughout our programming, and we even try to get it in on some of the, you know, the other topics as well, to show where this can be used to reach out to students. Because as you know, it's one of the most effective ways to inspire people's space exploration or overall support for the, for the mission. So, you know, as students get excited about it, their parents will get excited about it. And often the parents already are, but when their student gets really engaged into a Mars project or any other space exploration project, it tends to bring the parents along as well. So I think it's, it's all good. It has, there are very few, I can't think of any negatives to doing this sort of programming. <laughs> I would agree. And I, you mentioned the Afghan Girls Robotics Team, which sounds really exciting. Can you kind of tell us a little bit more about what they do and how they got involved with you all and uh, how you're bringing them in uh, into the summit this year? Well, I've been around for a few years. I don't know every the exact starting moment, but apparently they got, and there was a new article on them in the New York Times recently, if people want to go look that up. Sure. But apparently this all was derived from Dean Kamen from the first, you know, had apparently reached out and, you know, started motivating a group there, I think through Roya Maboob, and they started, they created this team. And so they've, you know, been around for a few years and have done some uh, work in Afghanistan. I've been traveling the world, kind of just showing, you know, the power of STEM education, you know, uh, showing, uh, well, frankly, how heroic they have been within Afghanistan, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, pursuing this, which literally is taking their lives, you know, you know, risking their lives to do it because, it's, you know, it's still a very complicated place for women, or particularly young women, to be engaging in this sort of activity. So I think this, we, we see them as just an inspiration for the world, you know, that if these young ladies can actually pursue these dreams in these, this environment, mm -hmm. you know, this is truly inspiring for people around the world. So I, so we, you know, we were very excited to get them and we hope to have them tour, you know, not only speaking at H2M, but hope to have them tour around DC as well. Although it's not their first trip for many of them, they're, they're fairly well known. I mean, and I think that it's such, amazing, it's such an amazing thing to be able to bring all these groups in that are out there from all over the world. It's, it's more about inclusion than it's ever been before. Everybody wants to be involved and everybody, more and more people are getting these opportunities. So I think it's great to put a, you know, put a spotlight on uh, such an amazing program like that. Um, so I know that uh, another thing that you uh, put a much greater focus on this year is networking. Uh, so this year's event is going to be uh, really big for so many of us because I know networking has been very, very big in, uh, in my career so far. So can you give some details on why you're introducing dedicated networking time to the Humans to Mars Summit this year? Uh, because we've been uh, pretty much, we've been crappy at it in the past. <laughs> now we've had, we've had people, <laughs> people to network with. But, and this was largely my fault, we tended to over-program, and now you'd, anybody who watched the agenda develop over time, you'd slowly see the brakes get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until they were almost non-existent. Yeah. And so it's always been one of these um, complaints, because it's, that's one of the reasons people go to conferences, why, why I go to conferences, and we always have such a really high level of speaker and participant, right. and so we try to, you know, we're still going to have a lot of programming, but... We, yep. hardwire, we hardwired in the break. So, you know, half an hour in the afternoon each day, 20 minutes in the morning, and, you know, and some other events as well. So hopefully that helps quite a bit. And, you know, but we went also to full three days instead of two and a half days, which helped in that. 
And I, I and you make a, a really great point about the programming. Uh, every single year, it just gets more and more impressive. And there are so many conferences across the world that you go to that are full of a lot of fluff in between the more important topics. And because there's such a focus with Explore Mars and Humans to Mars Summit, there isn't really a whole lot of downtime. It's always just some really amazing things. So since we can't talk about each panel and all of them are, are, are really, I mean, are just, they're, they're vital, can you highlight some of the ones you think people might be most excited about for this year's summit? Some of the more unusual ones, you know, like for instance, I don't know if people, you know, there's one we have called, and it's a very important one, called Feeding Mars. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the afternoon on the second day where we have people, you know, looking at what will it take? Will we be able to sustain human crews or human settlement on Mars? How will we feed them? So we'll have people looking at agriculture, people working on that, 3D printing of food, uh, synthetic biology, I can't say it, synthetic biology. Yeah. And, you know, a gentleman from a Silicon Valley company working on um, cell-grown meat, you mm -hmm. know, so you know, there was so much talk over years, people saying, oh, Martians will be vegan. And, you know, it's true, we're not likely to bring cows anytime soon. But, you know, it's, are, are, are they really going to be vegan? And what, what's really the definition? If you're not actually killing an animal, like if we were able just to bring a few cells along with us, and actually manufacture the chicken or the beef or whatever, you know, certainly want to pro provide meat. And, you know, that kind of falls into a whole different category as well, because you're actually not, it's, a, it's an animal byproduct because you're utilizing some cells, mm -hmm. but yeah. you're not killing any animals. I watched a video of one of these before, and this family was sitting down to uh, a meal of chicken, and then the chicken, the chicken walked by that they were literally eating. Yeah. <laughs> they had nice. all the cells from this chicken. Yeah. You're having a full chicken meal, and that chicken goes walking by. So, And I think that's really, I think it's a wonderful one, especially you know, one of the programs, uh, one of the people that I've worked with for a long time is Black and Farms. They were talking about how we're going to grow food and can, you know, would it do it you know, vertically, uh, urban uh, farming, that kind of idea. So those are big, you know, especially for somebody like me who wants to go. I'm a big guy. I like to eat. So it's a, it's a question that I definitely want to answer uh, for sure. Um, so a couple of major points I'd like to bring up next. One, um, so my the, my previous experiences at the summit have kind of brought this uh, brought this to mind, and I think they're kind of really big. So the first one is when you call uh, when you compare the cost uh, and consider the kind of caliber of speakers from other conferences in the Humans to Mars Summit. The price point for H2M is much more affordable. It's actually affordable for the regular public, which is, is really, really big. So it, it comes in at a fraction of the cost of so many others while still bringing a lineup that can really command the, the prices that others do. So why is that important to explore Mars to make it something that the average person, the, the fan, the, the person that wants to be involved, wants to know more about Mars, why is it important to it for Explore Mars to make that accept, uh, accessible and affordable to them? Well, that's the thing. We we want to make it approachable. And this is always where the balance has been. And I'm saying, you know, I admit it's not always easy when we're keeping such a low price point because you, we also have to pay the bills. And so it is trying to find that balance, but we have tried very hard to keep it below what other conferences are. You're right. Many, most of the conferences with the level of speakers we have, most of them are at least double what we charge for our conference, the usual suspects. Those are important. We want the aerospace professionals. We want the industry people. But one of the biggest complaints we hear at the um, some of these other conferences is that, oh, it's like an echo chamber. We never have anybody else in. Well, no, no kidding. And so we try to actively bring in different groups and different, you know, whether it be students, whether it be other industries, the general public, and just just may show that this is there's far more interest in this than just the usual suspects, more than the people who are going to make money off of it directly from a big NASA contract. Mm -hmm. And so that is very important to us. So it's once again trying to find that balance so we can actually pay our bills, but also maintain this balance. And it's how we structure the conference. It's also been an area some people get uncomfortable with because people say, well, we can't. You seem not to be able to make up your mind. Are you a professional conference or are you an advocacy conference? We are both. We're a hybrid. We're kind of, we're deliberately schizophrenic. We want people, you know, to come and be, you know, comfortable there and be able to get, you know, be able to do what they need to do, their networking and show that it's a really professional conference. But we also want it approachable for people outside the community so that they can be part of this. They can take a role or support it in some way because I think that's good for everybody. 
And uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned with approachability is the accessibility. It's another major draw. You go to a lot of these events, and it might be able to, it might be difficult for people to see if if you've only ever watched the the conference online. It may look like the other ones where okay, there's a million different things going on. Not really here. As soon as uh, as soon as the panelists really walk off stage, you walk kind of outside, and you really have the chance to uh, sit and speak with these people. Whereas other conferences, you're lucky to never see them again. They're kind of ushered out. And that's the that's the last of them. And now, of course, there's there's some people that will have to have that kind of you know security detail. Uh, but having the ability to have the conversations with these people after, depending on whether or not you're a student or if you're just a major advocate, is really really big. So is that something that you know you guys? had designed that way or is it something that happened organically because of what for whatever reason you're right we tried to keep it compact as well we do not you know it's in a you know we're always in a fairly large facility but it's still very contained mm -hmm. and we don't believe in having many 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 parallel sessions we try it's almost all one track the only time we go into parallel sessions is on the middle day in the afternoon we usually go to two or three parallel sessions and so, and that's that's the thing, trying to keep that focus, trying to keep everybody as much as possible in the same location. Yes, for exactly what you said, first off, because often, you know, I don't, you know, I understand with huge events like the Space Symposium or something else, you need to have, you know, all these smaller events because, you know, that's more intimate that way. You can't have every session in a room for 3,000. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, approachable. We are we are providing real access to these people, which is different than a lot of conferences. So I think once again, it's it's being able to create this environment where the people within the community have the access, but you're also providing students and others, you know, the access so they can realize, oh, these people are approachable. I can engage with these people, and this is something I may be able to get involved with. You know, people who come from it's yeah, it's remarkable the different you know different different disciplines that can be engaged in space exploration. You never know what you might think you're not. You don't have anything. Your profession has nothing to do with space. Mm -hmm. Then as you you start listening to this, you realize you know when I get got into it, my background is in space exploration. Mine is policy and history. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I was always interested in space exploration, but when I was in college for poli sci, I didn't realize, I didn't see how I could play a role in the space program. And that's where it's extremely neat within the space community. And I came in that way through the policy circles. <clears throat> and it's the same thing with a lot of other disciplines as well. It's not just aerospace, yeah, aerospace engineers. <laughs> yes. You need everybody. You know, like I remember also, like when we were pushing one of our student, comp our, our teacher competitions and our teacher workshops, we were at some event, one of these big events, maybe even a big teacher event or something. And we were, you know, calling out to teachers and she, one of them said, oh, I, 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 teach, I teach biology. I, it's not, I don't have anything to do with that. And they, we called her back. You absolutely do have something to do with this biology. She is one of the most important topics we think <laughs> regarding Mars. Yeah, absolutely. Whether there's biology there or not, we need the biology the biologists to determine that. And so, you know, there's so many disciplines, all, every discipline of STEM education. So you're at a National Science Teachers Association conference. <clears throat> you know, we like saying that there's not there's no discipline within the sciences and technology that's not applicable to Mars in some way. And uh, no, I mean, I think you make an amazing point, and it is really for everybody. And I think that's one of the reasons that it, it makes it one of the best conferences there, that's out there. So for people that have maybe they've never been before, they're just finding out about it, maybe they've only watched online, what is the thing that you think people would be most surprised about once they attend the Humans to Mars event for the first time? Uh, I think what the, uh, for people who are not part of, you know, don't follow this, I think they will um, be surprised at how viable, how realistic this is. I think, I think this is something that we haven't done, I mean, the community has, done, has not done a particularly good job at, at articulating reality. That reality is, the actual reality is more realistic than, you know, some of the things we hear, like, you know, how complicated it's gonna be. It is gonna be complicated, but you hear these, you know, these rumors, it's gonna cost a trillion dollars. Well, no, it's not gonna cost a trillion dollars, or at least, 
you know, over enough, a large number of years, you know, any agency is going to cost a trillion dollars if you go far enough into the future. Yeah, sure. but, yeah with NASA, they haven't spent even close to a trillion dollars since the beginning of NASA. You have plans for doing this. There are viable plans that are very realistic for getting to Mars in the 2030s or earlier. And so the show, this isn't, this isn't science fiction. There have been viable plans for a long time and showing them this is more a matter of we've got to make decisions. It's not, oh, we've got to come up with a plan. Well, we have to refine the plans, but it's mostly which approach are we going to take? We need to make decisions and we need to move forward on them. And to show that this is actually less an issue of engineering or science and more, and has been, you know, pretty much forever, more an issue of policy. That it's been, you know, while there are a lot of engineering challenges and scientific challenges, yeah. when it comes down to it, the biggest obstacle has been policy, consistent, sustainable policy, which means, of course, political support, but also funding. Even if you have, yeah, even if you're talking about more of a commercial pathway, like SpaceX, well, where does SpaceX get most of its space exploration funding? From NASA. <laughs> and so oh, yeah. now they get others, the yeah, other funding privately as well, but it's still, still a lot of the money still comes, even the ones they say are commercial are getting it from NASA. So it, it makes perfect sense. We have to continue to support. And I, I love that that's such a major focus of this event is uh, you know, focusing on the policy and making sure that. Uh, the people in power are understanding what it is that, that you're looking for, that we're looking for, the people that are advocates of this. So thank you so much for your time today, giving us a little bit of information about the upcoming event. Can you give people the website, social media pages, all that stuff so they can find out about ticketing, panelists, all that fun, all those fun things. Well, if they go to h2m at exploremars.org, uh, you should find all the information and all the social media should be there as well. Um, I'm drawing a blank on this, but no everything should be there. And once again, it's on May 14th through 16th at the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, D.C. We're excited, Chris Carberry. Thank you so much for being on today. And we're going to put all those links below in the YouTube uh, comment section so that way you guys can find everything you need. And that way you can hopefully join us. Can't wait. We're, we're really excited about it, Chris. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a few weeks. Absolutely. Thank you.